and also announce um, of audio video recording of this meeting by Ruth McGrath um, for Adam Cohen on the North Street, Street Association. Association. North, North Street Neighborhood Association. Right. I would like to um, make a motion on approving the minutes for May 20th. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay, Mary Claire. Mary Claire Higgins is here. She's the Executive Director of Community Actions. And welcome, Mary Claire. It's always an honor to have you here. Oh, thank you. Mr. And I know sir. you are going to be speaking on um, the overview of last year's community action activities and how many fuel and weatherization clients live in Northampton and an update on how those cuts will affect community action. Yeah. And you have a lot to talk about. I'm not going to talk about clients by the numbers. I'm going to talk yeah. to them by the amount of money we spent. So that's, that's our annual report. That's well on there. Ooh. That's Mayor Martin from Greenfield. Oh, it's Mayor Martin. It looks like you have an extra one? Uh, I, have, I have plenty. Can Ruth have one? Sure. Mm -hmm. And you can have one for Jeannie. It's Mayor Bill Martin. It's Mayor Bill Martin. Thank you. Sure. Wow. Thank um, you, Mayor. This kid's got a better graduation hat than I got. Yeah, he's got that. Because he's fit. So that's the overview of last year um, regionally. Um, so if you turn to page um, pages aren't numbered. Page the uh, second page in, you'll see a map of the region down right yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. So we have Hampshire and Franklin counties for um, for weatherization, fuel assistance, and all our CAP agency activities. And we have Western Hamden County with exclusion of Holyoke for Head Start. So we have a larger Head Start area than we do for everything else we do. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about energy and Head Start. We're still waiting to hear what's going to happen with some of the other programs. So this is last year's um, overview. And it's an interesting report. It kind of takes you through. Um, you know some of the things we do, and some of the statistics are are, are, are sprinkled throughout the program, throughout the report to see what we're doing. How many you know, 3,174 kids receiving WIC services, etc. So you can go through and see. On the last, um, towards the back, you'll see the budget. Last year we were at about um, 31 million dollars all in, and that includes our our core CAP programs. In addition, that includes. Army personnel, which we run as a separate related nonprofit, and a real estate corporation, which we run as a separate related nonprofit. So that page looks like this. Oh, okay. So the interesting part about that page is if you look at the two pie graphs at the bottom, mm -hmm. if you look at the sources of funds, which is the pie graph to the left, mm -hmm. or the donut graph, I guess yes. it is, you'll see that 54% um, of our state our fund money, money comes from the federal government. It gets thro flows through the state, but it's actually federal money. An additional 19% is federal funding direct from the federal government. So we are significantly impacted by the sequester because of the amount of federal funding that we have. Um, much more than, program, you know, than, well, even when I was here at the city, you, you know, federal money as a percentage of the total city budget is actually relatively small. In our case, it's, it's huge. very big. Right. Um, Commonwealth of Massachusetts direct is 9.1%. Um, Federal funding through local governments, and that's a place where community action gets money from the city of Northampton through CDBG, mm -hmm. and through the town of Greenfield through CDBG. We used to get some money from Orange. We do get some money from Shelburne. There's a bunch of smaller communities through their block grant. Um, United Way, a very small portion of our budget, but actually really helpful because it's flexible money that we can use in different ways. And then on the other side, you can see where the money goes. And you'll see that 50% of the money that we get in actually gets passed right through on the par bar graph to you, on the pie graph to your right. It goes to uh, client support, that's our homelessness prevention program. Um, in kind, Head Start gives us 80% of the true cost of running the program. We have to go find the other 20%. And so that is donated labor, donated goods, donated services, and donated real estate, which is what I will talk about that briefly. Um, WIC vouchers. We spend it, we issue about 1.5 million dollars worth of vouchers to young to women and their young children to be able to buy healthy food. Um, provider pay. That's a number that's going to drop in upcoming years. We ran the community re, we ran the child care resource and referral agency for many years, but 
the contract, we didn't feel comfortable uh, bidding on the contract again this year. It didn't actually have enough money to run the program in a responsible way, so we chose not to bid on it. Um, New England Farm Workers is now the Child Care Resource and Referral Agency for all of Western Mass. Go figure. Um, but So some of this was payment to child care providers for vouchers. Some of it, though, about a million dollars is payment to family child care providers or family child care educators that work in our system. People who live at, who work in their home caring for children. And we reimburse them for that care if the child's eligible for Head Start. Okay? Or a full day for child care. Um, so that's kind of a little snapshot of who we are. Is that, yeah. Any questions on that part? Well, so essentially, if you count the 54.3% of federal funding to the state, and add to that the 19% right. of the federal funding direct, three quarters of your donor is federal funding. Federal funding. Mm -hmm. Which is why I want to talk more about that than anything else. So what we know, right now we think WIC will be okay. We don't think we're going to be dramatically affected through WIC. The WIC state program has figured out some ways to help su support WIC. We don't have a final number yet, but we think WIC will be okay. That would be a disaster for you. Well, it would be very difficult. Um, and I have to tell you, our WIC program does some really creative things, including this program I love. They take people to the big Y and the stop and shop with their WIC coupon and help them figure out how to spend them on groceries in a reasonable and good oh, way. Oh, that's good. We also do farmer's market coupons with WIC. Um, and Colleen Paris, who some people know, Colleen, I don't I remember, she, I knew her, I've known her for 25 years when she was in high school. She's our community outreach person, lives in Northampton, and has done an incredibly good job of doing outreach to um, community partners, and she does this um, shopping program. We also do a Cooking Matters program, where it helps people figure out how to use their coupons and their food stamps to effectively buy food that they can use and cook. So it's a great, it's a great thing. Hmm. Um, so That's a good way of educating. I'm thinking I might have to go. You know, the coupons and going yeah. in there and teaching them? Yeah, it's good. So let's talk about weatherization first. Now, I made up these nice little graphics here for you. Okay. Did you know I, I like those? Pictures. I like pictures. Pictures are really like, helpful. I like big print. Yeah. Here's some big print. Thank um, you. So this is a snapshot of our energy programs year to date this year in Northampton. Okay, not by client number, but by how much money they spent. And I've met with Peter Wingate about these numbers. He's our energy director. And he thinks it shows that there's room for improvement in Northampton, that maybe we need some more outreach, because we think there's probably more eligible people for, for these the different assistant. programs. So let's walk through. The first one is LIHEAP. You see where it says LIHEAP up in this corner? Mm -hmm. That's what's no, that's what, that's the, the official name of fuel assistance. Okay. So you see that I note that in the paragraph, it says, Okay, so LIHEAP stands for Low Income Heating and Energy Something Assist oh, Energy Assistance Pro Program. program. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's right there. Low Income <laughs> Home Energy Assistance Program. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. So I just pull that out. Of right. So you can see who's eligible. You have to make up to sixty percent of the estimated state median income. Okay. So you know, so somebody making up to thirty-one thousand dollars a year could receive fuel assistance. Oh. You would, they wouldn't necessarily receive very much, but they could they receive get some. it. They it's might probably get the best time. time. But I want to remind you how much fuel assistance you really get. And I don't have them with me, and I should have put that in. But basically, people get enough money in, our fuel, in fuel assistance, the way it's set up now, to maybe fill their tank of oil one to one and a half times. That doesn't get people through the winter. So even if they're getting it, they still have to significantly spend their own money. OK? It's, a, it's, it's really... It takes us three times to fill us. Yeah, so you, would, so you would get help with one of those fills under this Ooh. scenario. So you'd have to go find the money for the other two or almost two fills, right? Um, and in our region, we have a lot of people heating with oil, heating with propane, heating with um, uh, wood pellets, even coal, mm -hmm. compared to like a, a Springfield or Holyoke where most people are natural gas or electric and less oil. And a lot of the people in our region don't have the option to convert to gas because, as you know, even in your neighborhood, it's not in the streets. I know. I wish we did. Right. But So you can imagine in your neighborhood that's true. Well, if you're in Wendell, it will never be true that you right. get natural gas, right? 
We were all pl praying to God that we would put that to gas. Remember with right. the reconstruction of Route 66? Yeah, I mean, I think the gas issue is big for, it's a big issue, right? So we have a lot of people on electric, rural folks who are on electric too, and high heat bills because of their electric. Mm -hmm. But if you're on gas or electric, you have the moratorium where the state, can, where the utility companies can't turn you off until the beginning of May or until April. So if you have oil and you run out, you run out. Yeah, There's right. nothing you can do about that. If you have propane and you run out, you run out. So, so why don't they make that a law? Uh, well, because the utilities are regulated by the state, but the private oil dealers are not regulated by the state in terms of, because they don't use the infrastructure. Right. They don't use the, the, the they highways, the streets, or the, yeah. they're not in the street, or they're not on the poles. They're not regulated. Can I ask you? She's sitting on a rickety. Our former mayor. Can you call me? Um, somebody said I saw something the other day in some office, and they're like, "Oh, look, it's our ex-retired ex-mayor." Ex ex and I said, "No, I'm not retired ex-mayor. <laughs> I'm, I'm just a tired ex-mayor." <laughs> 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 I mean, you can't help it. Well, you, should use the you should just call me Claire. <laughs> yes, okay, Claire. <laughs> My question is, I have some residents that which you know I was working very closely with on, on the fuel assistance program. And I'm hearing some people telling me that they call and they call. Yeah. Let me and talk about that. Yes, and they're not getting close So there back. have been significant cuts to fuel assistance over the last couple of years. And, and, and what they've in particular cut is what, we, what we're calling the administrative money, the money to run the program. So we, I showed you the map. You see what our territory is, right? Mm -hmm. All of Hampshire and all of Franklin County. We have about 10 people to run the program. We have over 9,000 clients. So yeah, we're not calling everybody back right away. If people are very, very good about following those prompts on that phone, on the automated phone system, they will get through. They will be able to leave the message and do what they need to do. Some people that's difficult for, okay? We have also trained in a number of the senior centers people to help people uh, people to apply for fuel assistance. Do they do that? I believe they do. And we also have a Northampton office. So we now That's we, the one on Vernon Street? We were at Vernon Street and because it wasn't as accessible as we thought it should be and because it's tough to have a building that's open to, to people coming in for fuel assistance and everything else and also have kids coming in and out of the building, especially through the front door and all that. So and teachers shouldn't have to sort of be directing traffic in the hallway so you can go upstairs for fuel assistance. We moved to old school commons there, right on the corner. So there's an office in the, in the basement. Well, Very I nice office. What? We're in the actual language. Uh, on the, I, I forget who used to On the first floor. On the first floor. Actually, yeah. there's community support options. We're about oh, okay. to get that. Yeah. When you That's walk in, you and you're going to go this way yeah. on that main floor, and we're down the hall, and we have, um, fuel assistance office there where we take appointments. It's not a walk-in, but we take appointments there. Um, so they just have to call? They have to make an appointment. Or they'll, you know, uh, we have youth programs there, and we have a, we're now the youth employment program for Franklin and Hampshire County. We also run our Gen Q, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender youth support program there, and we run a few other programs out of the youth programs. And then we also have our housing and, and community resources and advocacy. That's good. So those three programs share that space. You're closer to Peg. We're closer to downtown, and yes. we're closer to the court where people are going to. And um, mm -hmm. we have, a, you know, that we have a phone line that people call from all all of our regions, you know, from Hampshire, Franklin, and the North Quabbin, and people call and they can get an immediate assistance referral to various programs. But they can also real often make an appointment with somebody to come in and do a kind of a financial literacy scan, a financial stability scan, and then help them figure out what things might help to get them more financially stable. Maybe they were eligible for food stamps and they didn't know it. Maybe they were eligible for fuel assistance and they didn't know it. Maybe they need a little bit of money to help them fix their car, and we have a sort of little discretionary fund that we can use to do that. So that kind of thing. That's so that's there, but, it, but actually the phones are answered here, here, and or Orange, and or Greenfield. When the phone rings, you know, the person who calls from Northampton might be talking to somebody who's sitting in Greenfield. But they'll make the appointment for them here if they end up needing an appointment. We have an office in Ware, 
an office in Orange, an office in Greenfield, an office in Northampton to make those kind of appointments. So, that's a good idea. yeah, yeah. So that's fuel assistance. So you can see, oh, and then weatherization is the other part of the fuel assistance program on the other side of the page. So if you, this is helps folks lower their energy costs by taking energy efficiency measures. Those could include insulation. It could include right up to replacing the heating system if we need to. But there's a lot of folks who are renters, right? And if, if, the, if, if you're a low-income renter, you may be el your homeowner, your landlord may be eligible to participate in this program because you they are renting to low-income renters. Mm -hmm. And we have health landlords. We have a landlord program. We also have a landlord program through the utility company. So I'll give you an example. We had a, a person in Northampton who had a duplex. They, their heating system went, the heating system in the I rental unit went, right? So the landlord, he was on fuel assistance. Mm -hmm. So he was eligible for the weather, is it, federally funded weatherization program to get that heating unit replaced. So how do they do that? Is that like income too? By income, same, uh, same thing, income? same deal, income. And then the other, the tenant who was over income, but the house was owned by a person who, was, who made the income cut line. There's another program that also helps landlords fix their um, heating systems through the gas companies. So we were able to take some gas company money and fix the tenant's heating system at the same time, plus do weatherization measures, and I spoke to the person briefly recently, and they said they didn't even apply for fuel assistance this year. The difference in the savings yeah. from the upgrade on the fuel, on the on the heater and on the weatherization, they didn't have to. Does you, you work with National Grid at all? Uh, we're gonna, we do work with National Grid, and we work with all of the, you know, so we work with National Grid in hand. Right now, it's not. Yeah, we're, yeah. yeah na we are National Grid. <coughs> With Wemco and, Wemco and, 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 and uh, wherever, whatever utility company it is, that's who we work with, right? So Bay State Gas, Columbia Gas, or no, Berkshire Gas, Columbia Gas, whoever it is, we work with. And propane providers? They're not part of that. See, again, it's the regulated yeah. utilities. That so it's only the regulated utilities yeah. that we work right. with. Right. So, but if it's a non-regulated utility, if you turn to page two, by the way, the Fuel assistance is year to date. We haven't finished paying bills for fuel assistance. Weatherization, since it's a March to March program, mm -hmm. April to March program, that is the year, that's the final year number. That's the place we think we might have some room to grow. So. Mm -hmm. Page two is HeartWrap. That's another uh, heating system repair and replacement. That's just on systems. And we did, um, we, we did 9,200 this year, year to date, which is small. And we think there probably is room to grow there. But, but the other thing is, Peter and I talked about, we might have had a slow year this year, but I know we had a bumper, you know, it depends on the year. Some exactly. years you have a lot of people, some years you don't have so many people. Mm -hmm. but we think there's still room to grow there. And then energy audits, that's a uh, kind of a, an average number. Sometimes we'll go in and do an energy audit, and all we do is light bulbs. They're, they're in pretty good shape. That some people we too. go, right, but they're in good, pretty good shape, so all we have to do is light bulbs. Some people we go in, and they get insulation, they get the light bulbs, they get a, you know, I mean, it, it, so, the, so the, this is based on how many audits times the average. It's actually probably more money. Okay? So that tells you kind of what we're doing. All right? It, it, now, fuel is a federal program. All the money comes from the federal government. They're, well, last year there was a little bit of state supplemental. This year there really wasn't any state supplemental money in fuel. Um, and it's probably going to get cut to 5 to 5.5%. Five that's Which means that we'll be able to do let fewer homes in the weatherization side of the house, and we will be struggling around fuel. And you remember, I said you want to get a tank to a tank and a half. Well, you'll get less than a tank. You know, what do we do? less than that, right? What, what and I, I, I don't. You know, we do a fundraiser every year called Heat Up. There you go, Bill. And every year we do a little bit more in Heat Up. Yeah, well, I don't know she's, what we'll do she signs me up. Literally uh -huh. every person who comes to the I got to be stuck into the road. I'm actually thinking Mary Ann LaBarge would be better because, she, you know, you, you carry your own insulation with you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. My, my fuel assistance is, is me. Is you. <laughs> Mary Ann LaBarge, on the other hand, yeah. not so much insulation. I, 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 think, think, I think you'd be might very be. good. Oh, thank you, Bill. I think she's the poster job. I, I wouldn't so. be too good up there with I don't know what we would do, like having 
He would be excellent mayor. Here's all we do for, for the heat up. We don't do any of that. We just send a mailing out. Oh. Uh, and a number of you got it last year. And I had a pretty good return, but not everybody sent me money I from the city council. So we'll send it out again this Shame year. on us. Did you go? Yes. And, and we'll send it out again. And we raised about, um, I think, $37,000. That's, that's a lot of money. But when you think about how much it takes. How much is it? How much does it cost you to fill your tank once for your oil? That's how much. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I see it. And and we don't. When do you send these out? We'll be sending it out in the in the fall. In the fall? Yeah. So keep an eye open for it. Um, so that's kind of the picture on weatherization. It's not. You could announce that poll once we get it. You can announce it at city council. And that would be very nice. Yeah, that'd be at good. the councilors, we we'll donate to it, and they have to give you the check. So yeah, from the very well from what they're saying. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so it, that's a tough thing that, that you know there's we are looking at some cuts there. And you know, I know people are frustrated with the phone calls and so on, but I don't know how many people are gonna have next year to run that program. Why don't you, uh, you, would you, would you expand on that a little bit because the administrative costs Usually when people and rail against the fact that they frequently refer, refer to in any system, it's, it's the administrators that that these are people just collecting checks and going home to their very yeah, expensive right. houses and their expensive cars, and they don't really do much. They just sit in their office and tell people what to do. Yeah, so. well, except for me, I don't think that's true. <laughs> me, um, we... We have to negotiate our administrative cost with the federal government. We got a, a, a negotiated rate with the federal government last year. It was about 13 percent. This year it will be less than 13 percent. It's based on our historical cost. And so it won't be a huge amount of money. Well, and 13. Yeah, yeah. When did the alarm go off or something like the police right there? No, I don't see that. Maybe he's looking just for a place to get Might be looking for you to get on duty. <laughs> um, anyway, the administrative cost thing, you know. It, 12% of our, of our 12 to 13% is a pretty low overhead given what we're doing. Well, you know, in the we're allowed about a maximum of 15%. I'll, I'll confess it was a leading question because it, uh, I think that when people talk about administrative costs, it's really misunderstood what it is that administrative actually does and that it's considered to be, I mean, that so often people do default to it as being fact, but the yeah, fact that you cannot that. field the phone calls. Right, so in our can. case, there's two different parts of the administrative cost. There's our central administrative cost, and that's the people who um, manage the payroll, manage the billing, manage the facilities, and the IT. Don't forget, we have to cover that big area with a, a network right. and, a, and the phones and everything else. So. My salary, the associate director's salary, the chief financial officer's salary, all of that is in that, in that pile of money. And then each of the programs have some administrative costs as well. In the case of fuel assistance, it's the people who take the applications and answer the phones, it's the people who, and they verify the, the um, applications. You, we're not just, somebody can't just come in and say, I qualify, give me the money. No, they gotta go through an They gotta go through an application process. They have to prove that their income is what their income says. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes in and gives us an address and we think the address looks a little mm -hmm. not okay, mm -hmm. we'll verify that that's a legal address. Mm -hmm. If somebody comes in, for instance, uh, we had a, well, I don't remember what town it was, but somebody said, this is my address. And, and we, they had remembered that that address a couple years ago, it, was, it wasn't a separate address. There wasn't a second apartment in that building. So okay. that wasn't really legal. Mm -hmm. And they'll go and figure that out because they have to do that. And if somebody might have doesn't, doesn't agree, they can appeal it to the state. But we have had number, numerous, you know, they, they have to approve the application. In some cases, they have to deny the application because the person's not income eligible, you know, or the person's address, because of where they live, they're not eligible. Do you think you know? some of them will just come in and just take off an address, just give an address? Um, you know, listen. 90 probably 95% of the people in the world are honest, and maybe 5% of them are trying to get over them, right? I think many, many of the people who use, most of the people who use our, serv use our services are, are honest. I would say there's a higher percentage of people trying to get over working on Wall Street than coming into our office to get fuel assistance. That would be my 
Uh, well, certainly it manifests as a bigger dollar. Amount That's right. Structure. So and and so we there's an income verification process. That's part of the overhead. There is a um, we have to cut the checks. We have to create contracts with all the fuel vendors. So think about this. We don't tell people who are getting oil, you can only use this vendor. If you've always gotten your oil from Sandry, well, you can get your oil from Sandry. If you always got your oil from Country Oil, well, you can get your oil so from they Country can Oil. Go where they if you've got O'Connell, historically, you can go to O'Connell. They have to agree, but then they have to make a contract with us. Okay. And then we send the check directly to the oil company. We don't send the check to the client. We send it directly to the oil company. And are they but faithful paying them? What's that? Are they faithful paying? We pay. I have to say, we have good vendors because they know they get delayed in payments because we don't always have the money on hand from the state. Mm -hmm. They're very patient with us. We try to pay our local vendors first and have the utility companies wait because they have more money, to be honest. Right? Yeah. And those clients are protected by the moratorium. So that's part of the overhead, right? But all that happens. And then, by the way, most of these people get laid off in the summer because we don't have enough money to keep them year round. And just about everybody that works for us in that program, with the exception of the main, is eligible for fuel assistance. I would bet. Unless there is no spouse in the family. We don't pay them enough. If they were a single person, they're eligible for fuel assistance. Well, I could see that with the layoffs in the summer. Do. Now, we keep some people year-round because we start the program right up in the summer. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a federal program. It's a fed Money comes to the state in October, right? Mm -hmm. So we, don't we try to hold on to money from the year before, right, to bring it into October to, to run the program. Yeah. This year, because of the sequester, there's no money to hold over, so we're going to be laying people off. Hopefully, the state is going to front money starting July for us first for us to start up the program. They approved it in the Senate budget. They didn't approve it in the House budget. Otherwise, we have to wait to start a program. That sequester still Well, that actually, to expand on sequestration, I know you didn't necessarily bring big pie charts on that, but Not Head Start was one of the targeted groups. I have that. Oh, good, okay. Because the... That one I have. Good. The federal government, of course, wanted, when sequestration loomed and reared its ugly head as they were about to go on break, right. that they, they moved very quickly to a make funds available to FAA uh, um, uh, tower airport regular uh, uh, air traffic controllers. air traffic controllers thank you there's the word um, that's what Karina does in the airport. yes <laughs> air traffic control keeps people from yeah, crashing sure does. but the the, the 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 fact is that that was clearly enlightened self-interest on their part but head start actually has arguably a greater impact on the sequestration I only yeah, it's, totally is. Listen, it really depends on which, every department is, it, it's affected a little differently. My sister works for EPA, they didn't cut contracts, they, all those staff are taking major furloughs. Right. So, so every time I talk furloughs, to my sister, yeah. she says, I'm on a furlough day. So she's losing about, I think, nine work days this year. She's getting basically on nine pay, days that she won't get paid for. Okay. Which is so a significant, that. that's a significant cut, that day, is. especially to the lower paid worker. Mm -hmm. So there's furloughs in some places. The way the Head Start, and it all depended on how the appropriation was set up in the federal government. So in Head Start, staff aren't taking furloughs because that's not the way the appropriation right. was. The, the cut is to the contracts. And actually the cut is only to, it's not to the training and technical assistance money, it's only to the money that funds the classrooms and the services. But that's the way the appropriation is set up. Okay. So, it, so they don't, remember the whole discussion last year about give them discretion, give the administration discretion? They don't have discretion, so that when they're doing these sequester cuts, they have to do them that way. So All those prescribed cuts, <coughs> the whole thing about sequestration was supposed to be so terrifying. That's is that right. these are, they, there was, that gave them absolutely no room, and they were just draconian cuts not based on need or even right. sensitive to any, any uh, nuance, uh, yeah. nuance or sense. It was right. just across the board cuts. And it's supposed to kick, scare the bejesus out of the people who are principally concerned about military and defense spending. And for some reason, the Pentagon has much better lobbyists than uh, people with children head start. I'm not sure why that is, but it seems to be the way it plays out. So, um, now listen, the head start cut, I, I want to talk about that. Yeah. I just want to note that um, in Northampton, 
we did a, a number of jobs. We did most of the jobs we did for income eligible people were actually for homeowners that were income eligible. Um, one, two, three, four. No, five, when they six, say seven, eight, income nine, eligible. Out of 23 jobs, nine, so more were for, for homeowners than renters. What, what would be income? I don't get this. Well, their income is under $60,000 a year if it's a family of two. Uh, oh, four. oh four. okay. So it's almost. It's right like, on that sheet. Right on that one. Yeah. Okay. Just so you know, that, so out of, we did some out of base debt gas, was about $26,000. DOE WAP funds were, were, were $12,000. Hello there. Hi, Gene. Hi, Gene. <laughs> it's raining. Sorry, I'm late. It's raining. Oh, just fine. Never going to stop right now. National Grid, about $31,000. That's um, your book. Oh, thank you. I think I put one of those over there. <laughs> um, and so, in general, that's the way it works. And, and so, when you hear the admin cost cut, you're right, it's going to affect our ability to answer the phones, it's going to affect our ability to administer. to administer, and that's true both on the fuel assistance side, but also on the weatherization side, because somebody has to spec those jobs, somebody has. We don't do those jobs ourselves. We hire local contractors to do the jobs. They sign an agreement with us, we are not the highest payers in the world but we're a steady stream of referrals for those kinds of jobs. And, um, and does it go by like a bid system? Or no, we sign up, you know, if, if somebody, if, so somebody has work that, that we have identified needs to be done in their house. They may have had a, somebody who, who's been taking care of their heating system all along. Mm -hmm. Let's say you're a, a retiree, you're 70, right? Mm -hmm. You now are, in, are income eligible because your income has gone down, right? You're on yeah. Social Security. Yeah. You always had O'Connell do this work. Well, you could say, well, you know, I still want to have O'Connell do the work. Well, as, as long as O'Connell's willing to take our price, we're happy to pay O'Connell to continue to do the work. Okay? okay? Yep. That's the way it works. Okay. okay. So um, that's the way that works. Okay? Yeah. And we, um, so we have contracts. I, I had to sign a lot of contracts recently, so actually it's a separate issue. But, oh, okay. But we really, we literally have hundreds of contractors and vendors for fuel, for fuel, for, for um, who do who do work for us, you know, heat, heating system work and insulation work and so on. So it's a big, big program. Okay, yes, so let's go to Head Start now. So I we, like Head Start. We like, what's not to like? Evidently, something. So, something. Um, <laughs> they just have a lousy lobby. So yeah, uh, let me just explain our thought process, and then I have it in writing here. But I'll, let me walk through it. So you know that we have we're under sequester. Um, we are also under something called recompetition under the Head Start renewal of 2007. Head Start Head Start has 1,700 what they call performance standards that you have to meet. You have to you have to comply with these 700 performance standards. It's a lot of performance standards. That is. Probably thicker than the uh, board of the building code. You know, it's it's pretty it's pretty it's pretty massive. So that is. Yeah. So um, before I came, Head Start had some trouble with uh, our, our local Head Start had some trouble with um, had some peeling paint on, at two sides and some cracked floor tiles. We that was considered a deficiency, even though it was corrected in 30 days. Under the new Head Start regulations, we had to reapply for our entire grant based on those two deficiencies. So we did. Um, we, in the intervening time, I got hired there. We applied for the grant to run the program in Westfield, West Springfield, and Agua, and we were awarded that, even though we had this deficiency. Mm -hmm. Then they sent out the renewal, and we applied for the whole grant, and we have, we have been waiting to hear about that. In the intervening period, the, the, sequester, the sequestration happened. So we didn't even know if we had a grant, and we knew we had a cut. Long story short, they have told us that we are, the, we are indeed are going to continue to be the grantee, and they very much liked our proposal. And thank you very much. And uh, but we have to cut 5.27 percent from our our total grant. So we have 587 children in care throughout the three counties currently in in Head Start, and 77 children in early Head Start. Head, early Head Start is birth to three. How many? 77. So, 587 children. That's what we had. Now I'm going to walk through what, what we're doing. Head Start said you have to cut, but you have to maintain quality. 
And they also, in the two, remember the 2007 Reauthorization Act that I mentioned, mm -hmm. where you have to recompete if you screw up any one of those 1,700 performance standards? Yeah. They also said 50% of the teachers nation, nationally working for Head Start have to have bachelor's degrees. Okay, and the state is saying if you want to be at the highest level for, for reimbursement for early care and education, 100% of your teachers have to have bachelor's degrees within the next couple of years. Okay, we'll be in school forever. So, so our teacher's salary was about $26,000 a year for a bachelor. So. Remember the fuel assistance income cutoff? Mm -hmm. They qualified for fuel assistance. Yeah. Um, so we said, you want us to keep quality? You want us to keep quality? We're going to look at the key indicators for quality, and then we're going to make our cuts based on what we need to run a quality program. Mm -hmm. So we looked at our teacher salaries. We were the second lowest. Teachers were getting paid the second lowest of, of the region. That's New England. That's all. Our teachers were the second lowest paid. I don't know who the first or lowest paid was. County yeah. So we said, what happens if we bring them up to just below the average, at about thirty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, which is just below the average? We they will still be in that okay. scenario. They're still paid less than Brattleboro, who is mm -hmm. our program to the north, and Hol Holier Chick Chickabee Springfield Head Start. They're still paid lower than them. Not a lot, but they're still lower than them. So we said, okay, let's bring our teachers up to that level. Education staff. What happens if we really have the right teacher-child ratios and the right group size? Okay, so some of our classrooms we had up to 18 kids with two full-time teachers and one part-time teacher and one part-time aide. Really what we should have is 16 to 17 kids with three full-time people. That's what we really need to have. And then we need to have that because these are not, these are by definition all at-risk kids. Okay. English language learners. Yeah. Children with special needs, mm -hmm. children who have experienced trauma, children living in poverty and extreme poverty. They have, they have significant, they can come to the classroom with significant issues. That doesn't mean every kid does. Some of them are fabulous, you know, but there's that, there are kids who come to, the, to us with significant issues. Some of our, we also have a contract with the state to have closed referral kids referred to us from the Department of Children and Families because there's an open case with that department because of abuse and neglect. So we need to have a ratio that reflects the, so just think about this. You've I got, can see that, 17 kids with three full-time teachers. You can see where you would need that. So you have a kid who's freaking out. Right? Yeah. The state ratio is one to 10 or two to 20, right? So any, once you get to that 11th kid, you have to have two people. You have a kid who's freaking out and you want to take the rest, you want to take everybody outside, if you don't have another person, you can't take them outside. Mm -hmm. So you have one person dealing with the kid who's freaking out. You have the other person dealing with the other 17 kids, 16 kids. You need that third person to make the classroom work, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> okay. That's a fair Does process. that make sense? Oh. Right. So that's what we did. We put together, here's what would happen with our ratios. And then we also looked at buildings. We looked at... Um, what has to happen to our buildings? Well, how much how much money do we have to have in our maintenance lines so we don't get cited again for cracked floor tiles and peeling paints mm -hmm. and have peeling paint? Have to write a 200-page application to ask or whatever the heck it was, right? So what happens, right? So we up those numbers, and finally we looked at um, access because in in where a couple of years ago we removed the transportation because we couldn't afford it. We thought we you know we said we have to make a cut, so we're going to cut that transportation. We, they really need that transportation. Those okay. kids, they really need the transportation done. So we restored the transportation where we put the, all that into the, the Google machine, or not the Google, you know, the, the, the budget machine. Yes. And um, in order to pay reasonable salaries that are not particularly enriching, to have the right class size, to have the right, to have better facility funding, and to deal with transportation, we need to cut 129 children. A hundred and twenty nine children. Out of you, out of two or five hundred. Out of out of five hundred eighty seven. Out of five hundred eighty seven. Right now, a hundred and fourteen of those children will not actually be out of care. Okay, because remember, it's a Head Start program. Mm -hmm. Kids go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. So every year, a big cohort of kids leave to go to kindergarten, mm -hmm. and then we recruit three year olds to fill that space. So 
we will be able to take in fewer children, but we're not throwing that number of children out. We're not actually, we, there are, I think we're down to 14 children that may need care, that we need to work with, 14 families that we may need to work with. In, in this um, program, the uh, net school spending or, or foundation is not, is, doesn't, doesn't play into anything? It doesn't exist. This is an entirely different, yeah. entirely different program. Do they I have, would love it if they had a... So I, they, I just wonder if they do they set no, a particular no, amount you spend on a child? No. Everybody's rate was different, mm -hmm. which is why some programs had much higher salaries mm -hmm. and we had a much lower salary. Yeah. Our rate per child historically had been low because the agency had the program for a very long time. If you were a new program provider came, coming in in the 90s, you would have negotiated a higher rate per child. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Community Action had this got these contracts since the 60s and early 70s, they were low rates, and then they always opted to expand access versus raising the rate per child. So we so, are making a decision to raise the cost per child. And so what is the number, what is the cost right now per child? You know what, I could do the math. I, it's a simple calculation. Yeah, okay. I can't I'm do just it. Curious. Okay, just I, I gave you some numbers on that. <coughs> it sure isn't $14,000 per child. No, yeah, I think we're. In the, I, have, I think we're in. They're going to be in the nine thousand dollar range for a preschooler, and, and the twelve thousand dollars for an infant toddler. These are full day, full year programs. Those are our full day, full year costs. Okay, that's close enough. Sure. And when I say full day, full year, I mean we're open at seven thirty in the morning till five thirty in the evening, and we're open. Um, Two hundred and forty-eight days, as opposed to a school, close to one hundred eighty. As opposed to one hundred eighty school days. Um, you know, with a six and a half to seven hour day. We're really open. Yeah. That's a lot. Those are for the full day, full year programs. So what we did was we said, okay, that that's what we need to do if we're going to really preserve quality. And by the way, how do we say to a parent, yeah, you're going to drop your kid off here and they're going to be okay. Well, maybe they're not going to be okay because we're not doing the right thing. Right? We have to do the right thing. Yeah. So we drew up a plan that, um, and I'll walk you, here, I'll walk you through the plan. Okay. Um, uh, it, it goes through all of our areas, not just um, Northampton, but I'll, I'll go you. through all the areas with you. The first part explains, oh, the place filled up. First part is just what I just talked to you about, the, the rationale, right? Page two, if you get to, um, so as I said, recruiting and retaining qualified staff. By the way, our turnover rate for people just looking to get a pay increase, because they couldn't live on what they were making from us, was 24% a year. Okay, and our staff, as I said, were the second lowest. Um, so then go to uh, the bottom of page, the second page, PCDC program plan for the next fiscal year. Mm -hmm. Cut by 129 slots, 94 half-day center-based slots, 12 home-based slots, and 15 Head Start family child care slots. Okay? It says here currently enrolled 27 children. That number's already been dropped, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But, uh, we're restructuring our departments, so our transportation department, our enrollment department, and our health department, and some others are being restructured, and we're also we're reducing and combining some positions there. We're, um, we're going to be starting later this year the nine-month program that we have for Head Start, which is actually a 160-day, not a 180-day program. Mm -hmm. We'll start at the end of September. It usually starts mid-September. Um, so. Early Head Start and full day, full year programs are not being cut. So no parents that are full day, full year that need full day, full year care to go to work are being cut. Somebody who's depending on Head Start as part of their child care patchwork arrangement could, lose, could, could be jeopardized. So by county, in Franklin County, we had a, a two classroom collaboration with Berniston and Northfield that was known as the Better Start program. We helped pay for the classroom there. Those children received Head Start services. Wow, it's a really wonderful program. Looking at the poverty data throughout the region, that was one of the programs we decided that we needed to cut. And, and also Orange, we're, we're eliminating one classroom there. There were some enrollment challenges in Orange. Orange is a small town. It's about 7,000 people. We needed to enroll 32 to 4, 34 kids there to be fully enrolled in the two classrooms. We were having struggling to fill the second classroom. So we're opening, keeping one classroom open, Second classroom will be available for home-based children. Home-based is a family, is a, is a program where an a early childhood educator works with the child and the mom or dad in the home or guardian in the home. What's center-based slots? The, uh, in, in, a, in a building. 
that is a child care center like Vernon Street, so, and okay. as opposed to family child care, which is a family child care licensed provider who cares for kids in their home. But you're reading ahead. No, this is a, this, this is the first oh. page. Oh, okay. Page one. Because it's on page three. I you're talking about the reduction of slots. I just wanted to send center, center base. Slots. You're right. You're right. Um, center base. Yep, yeah, that's in in a a, a classroom in a, okay. in a child care center. In Hampshire County, we're closing the Northampton and Northampton High School classroom sites. Now, North, North Amherst has two classrooms. Northampton High has one classroom. At Ryan Road, which was so a, that one. Yep. In Ryan at Ryan Road, which was a three-day-a-week yeah. combo classroom, three days a week at the center, and and one day a home visit, and I think there was one day no service. I don't remember exactly the schedule. Um, we're going to actually expand that to a five-day-a-week classroom. So Ryan Road will stay at a five-day-a-week classroom, but 16 kids in Northampton will lose services because we're closing, on average, yeah. you know, on average. Um, we're also eliminating four Head Start family child care slots. Um, in Hampton County, remember that we were in Hampton County. Mm -hmm. um, we're eliminating five Head, Head Start family child care slots, 12 Head Start home-based slots, we had a site in West Springfield which we're moving out of because the rent was exorbitant, renting from the diocese. And we're moving into a site we have in Westfield. We'll do morning and afternoon sessions for kids, and we'll bus kids from West Springfield until we are able to identify a new site there. We're also reducing the class size there. That was a site that had 18 kids with two and a half staff, and significant numbers of non uh, English language learners in those classrooms. So we really need to reduce ratios there. That's also. Franklin and Hampton are really the poorest parts of our service area. They're Hampshire County, you know, Northampton needs a service, East Hampton needs a service where, and, and Amherst are where we have sites, but uh, as a whole, Hampshire County isn't as poor as Franklin County or Hampton County. Mm. Um, so that's what we're doing. So total grant last, this current year is 5,899,000 something. And next year it would be five million six hundred. So we're losing about two hundred sixty-six thousand dollars. That's a lot of money. And that's what represents the cut, right? So we have, we'll go down to four hundred fifty-eight Head Start spaces. We have two hundred eight employees in PCDC, which PCDC stands for Parent Child Development Center, which is the combination of our Head Start program and our full day full year child care programs that are a blended approach. We are laying off everybody who works in a half day program, and they're reapplying for their jobs be hired in September, to come back in September. Um, we also will be making changes in the central administration of the agency because, as, as you recall, um, when Bill asked about the overhead or the administrative cost, mm -hmm. because the grant is going down, the agency will also lose money because of that cut, and so we will have to make some cuts or some reorganizations in the agency as well. Is, is, is this all of your funding, or is there any, there's nothing else, somewhere else, it's just the six million? That's all our PCDC money. You, yeah. In your book, if you look in the back of that book, the total budget last year was yeah. thirty-one million. Okay. But we we don't you know yet the cut. All grant money. Oh yeah. There's no other. Yeah. 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 Um, there's no. It's all various state, federal, local, and grants and private foundation money. Um, we don't know. So the one other piece of funding that I didn't do a, a write up on is something called CSBG, Community Services Block. That's the core funding that funds community action agencies. We're a community action agency. Valley Opportunity is a community action agency. There's one in Springfield, Coast, um, I think it's called Springfield Partners or something. No, Springfield Partners in Action. So they're, they're all these, you know, ABCD in Boston. There's, that's, I think, 1,300 or 1,400 state, or nationwide. They were came out of the uh, war on poverty in, in the 60s. This core money allows us to provide Services. And remember, I was talking about people who can call up and get financial counseling. That's paid for out of our CSBG. Okay. Part of the rent at this site is paid for to give access to people living under 125 percent of poverty, the poverty level. That's to give them access to services in Northampton. Mm -hmm. We expend that money. We can use it kind of flexibly as long as we're meeting national objectives and, and the services go to people who are at 125 percent of poverty or less. That grant is probably going to be cut between five and six percent. So I will, uh, we'll see what, what what the implications of that are as well. So anyway, that's where that's where it is. That's awful. 
So basically, with my rudimentary math skills that I possess, that, that this actually, a because of the two pressure points, increase um, enhancing and improving the, deliver, the service that you're delivering, plus of the 5%, 5.7% sequestration yeah. cuts, yeah. it actually looks like it's manifesting close to 20 to 30 percent reduction 20. in service. Yeah, that 20 something percent, I think, in kids. Our cut is, co is com commensurate with the cut that Springfield, Holly of Chickory Springfield Head Start is doing, and the slot numbers are, are going to be higher than that 5.27 percent, what we're actually cutting. We're cutting more slots than that. That's correct. We are. And I think that's going to be true across the country. Right. Um, I don't think it's going to just be us. We are, but we're in a unique position because remember I said we had to reapply for our grant? Right. Well, as part of our uh, part of our negotiation for taking the new grant, we're negotiating that that reduction. Okay, so you're in a position to actually a little bit to negotiate a little bit. We're not we're not in a position to negotiate any new money. Right. But we are saying, look, if 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 you want us to provide a quality program, this is what we need you to do. So Head Start un is unique in that there's a parent governing body, a parent and community governing body called the Policy Council. The Policy Council, which is a parent and community governing body, approved this plan, and it included the parents that were in programs that are being closed. And they all supported this plan because they know how difficult it is for their kids to have a teacher leave mid-year because they just can't, can't afford to stay. Oh, um, so, um, right, and we're pushing more and more of them to have bachelor's degrees, and we're saying, but we can't pay you any more than whatever we're paying you. So, um, the Community Action Board of Directors has approved the plan, and the Head Start Regional Office has approved the plan. We're awaiting our signed contract from the Head Start National folks. But there, I don't I expect that that will happen. It's going to happen before the end of this week. You, you said 60 or 70 percent of your teachers have bachelor's degrees? Is that no. Uh, we're at, on track with the, na the, the national goal is 50 percent of, of the teachers by 2013, and we're tracking that goal, and I think we're doing a little bit better. And it, some that's point they wanted to be a hundred percent. That's correct. Twenty six thousand dollars a year. Well, thirty now. Yeah, it's thirty. Thirty. We're not for. There'll still be eligible for for fuel assistance. I'd imagine the silver lining of this would be that sequestration would also affect uh, oversight and, and and inspectors. No, so they, so they, every time they find a cracked tile, that you're going to hear about it because. Those well, that brings me to the facilities issue. Now, as you recall, we, we, I said that we have to make up 20% of our budget for the, you missed this, Gene. If, um, um, the way Head Start works is that they, here's the total cost of running the program. But 20% of that has to be made up through in-kind donations. So that's labor, that's donated services, donated materials. But the biggest single place we get our donations and make that 20% in-kind is through um, facilities. So Vernon Street is, a, is an in-kind donation to mm -hmm. the program that allows us to run the program. The classroom at Ryan Road is an in-kind do donation that allows us to run the program. Mm -hmm. uh, in Turner's, I think we have a site at Central Street, which is, a, is counted as in-kind. We own a building at G Street. Um, Orange, the classrooms there are donated by the town. That helps us. In Westfield, the mayor has been extremely generous as well as Northampton has, and there's a building that has like 10 classrooms in it or something like that. So that's how we, or not 10, but more than more than Vernon Street. Vernon Street has some significant facilities issues that I identified when I was here, but you know, I was, you know, it wasn't the top of, top of, top of mind at the time, now it is. And uh, we've, uh, we have petitions for some money to fix. If you've been up there recently, you'll notice that there's a been tape around the corner of the building. There's some parapet roof issues, we, Head Start is willing to give us $200,000 to invest in that building to fix the most immediate issues in that building, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I think the building needs a significant investment, and we're going to be thinking about how to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and not, not saying to the city, you have to do it, but can the city partner with us to figure out how to get to making that building? Mm -hmm. Or if not that building, another building in the city, a good place for kids to be. Because I think the city still needs a Head Start building. So, most immediately, I'll be talking to the mayor, assuming we get this $200,000 about can we do the work on the roof, because and David Pomerantz is aware of the work that needs to be done on the roof. Um, more more long-term, the building really needs to have 
also I think it probably needs new windows. It needs, um, it should be converted. It's an oil based, it's oil now. It really should be converted to gas. We're looking at, into that. Yes. That will save the program a significant amount of money that we put just right back into the classroom. Exactly. So I think that's our last oil heated building in the city. Right. And, it was, and, and you know, we, when, when the city did the ESCO, none of the buildings that were rented out, I think, with the we had none of the buildings that were rented out were, were done. Uh, we, none of them were put on the list because the city didn't know if they would continue to have control of them, which made sense. We're looking at what uh, what the utility companies might be able to do for us or whatever. See if we can get it done. I want to open this up to public comment. Would anybody like to speak about um, Mary Claire Higgins on um, community action?
everything is now done, with the exception of the porch construction, which we're still kind of seeing if we have more money. And guess what? What? A hundred thousand dollars more in CDBG than we thought. You got a big change. No, I'm not. So we were told that it was. We were told to plan on a 5% reduction from last year. Yes. This is after a combination of 30% reduction over the last two years. So we planned, well actually it was 10% first, and then I think by the time I got with you all it was 5%. Yes. And then they were saying level funded. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, it's more money. So Outstanding. it's money that's wow. reclaimed that through the course of projects not happening you know, in the rest of the country. We're not reconvening again, are we? Well, I... Cam and I need to sit. I mean, public <laughs> services is still 15% of it. Yeah, right. Yeah. But, but we just finally found out. I got monitored by HUD last week, and he said, yes, it's real. This is a number that you can go with. We're supposed to have the annual action plans in the middle of May. Mm -hmm. But since the numbers were still fluctuating, they gave everybody extensions to the end of this month. Mm -hmm. So now that we know it's real, it's like 621,000-something instead of the 521. So we have to sit and see what the repercussions are for public services with the 15% formula and then see whatever else you know, the mayor wants to do with the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So it's really good news and we, I think we can definitely apply a little bit more to all the um, CDBG grantees. So um, we started the monitoring and just doing all the year-end stuff so that I may, I definitely have to let you guys in on you know the recommendations, and then you make the final mm -hmm. recommendation that then goes to the mayor. So yeah, it's a good thing. Cool. That's um, beautiful. So the Grove Street painting contract, it's been out for bid. The contractor's been selected. It's evergreen. I think they're out of Springfield, and they have just been waiting for the rain to stop. Yeah. So they have what? Waiting for the rain to stop. Oh, no, no. So we let Jack. And Ron picked the colors. What did the bid come in at? Huh? What did the bid come in at? 31. Yeah. So Jack Horner and Ron Skin contributed the 20 grand. And that it was 10 grand the first time they did it. So they upped it to, and I don't think I brought the paint colors. Oh, yeah, I did. Um, so we were thinking about this kind of a scheme, and this is a really bad picture, but it definitely will pop a lot more than the darker hues that are on there now. Yeah. So, um, like a lighter color for the lighter color for the back, and then this would be like the doors, and then this would be the trim. So I think it'd be beautiful. pretty snazzy as you come up the hill. Um, and the kitchen work is all done. Tom Gross of ServiceNet's maintenance department took the lead on getting the, the low cost donated discounted kitchen cabinets from was it Kohl's? 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. it was from. And I have the before pictures of the kitchen here but I couldn't find the after so I don't want to bum us out by showing the before <laughs> pictures anymore. But um, this was the original list that was you know drawn up in 2009 so the renovations to the first floor bathroom done renovations to the second floor men's bathroom done renovations to the women's bathroom done um, window replacement <laughs> not replacement but the storm windows storm windows, windows itself yeah, storm Absolutely. windows yep. um, upgrading the kitchen cabinets and countertop dealing with the food storage Part, insulating the pantry on the far end and we're kind of touch and go and continuing to monitor the heating system but the last time I checked it was working okay, okay. and the front porch upgrade and structural report support is the only thing left so I'm thinking oh, okay. that we're probably going to have enough yeah. seating. oh my goodness where'd you yeah. look at the cabinets towels is it cold cowls? Cold. Cowls. Yep. cowls. Okay. And they've, how long have they been? I can't even remember how long they've been in now. Because um, they just, they fit so well. It feels like they've been there forever. Where did yeah. they come from? Cowls. Where's like at least six months? They're Emerson. 
So this section was this section was pretty much completely redone, and the sink was pulled, and there was a lot of moisture underneath the sink behind. Yeah. And all that's been redone, and the fly would be done underneath, and it's moisture proof. There was some leakage in the faucet area that the city crews. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you guys actually did any work. I think they brought the stuff in, did the layout, negotiated the deal, and then it was our central services guys that actually did it. Did the work, yeah. Roger and Jonesy. So this whole section yeah, has redone. Great. I think the upper ones on the stove side still needed to go in. I don't know if they're in yet. But That's that the new last cabinets? piece. No, no. These are the I old didn't think ones. So. Okay. Yeah, and then this whole... And they're holding up. The new ones are holding up so well. These are the these are the befores, so when we go up, we'll be able to mm -hmm. celebrate. And then this is the wall as you come in the back door, and all that is new also, so... I think we're... Insulating in, in the pantry is all done? It's all done. Those issues, yeah? Cool. Yeah. yeah, that was... Yes. Actually, that made a difference. That yeah. I remember going in there and seeing... You can see the light. You can see right through the walls. <laughs> you know, the yeah. boards were separated. Oh, I gotta go. I have to go check it out. So, what's yeah. the tour? Um, the painting is gonna. They're they're what contracted and ready to go. So, so what do we do now? They're just, saying it's thirty-one thousand, and Jeff and Ron are doing twenty thousand. Where do we get the other one? CDBG. Oh, good. Okay. Eleven. Which we had without any problem. Yeah. Even before we got the addition. So what else do we have to do, like the front porch? That's it. Well, we were we were talking about, you know, there was there's there's some assessment that since it's not really secured very well, if we needed it at all. But Danielle was, you know, it's really much more um, substantial when you get into it. You know, there's serious molding tied in. It's wow. it's a real structure. It's not just something that's been thrown up. So we did determine that, you know, getting Soldier on up there was just more trouble than it was worth paperwork-wise and liability-wise. And so we were waiting to kind of see how everything settled out with the painting bids to see if we had anything left over. And I think we can definitely, I can't imagine that it's probably going to be more than like five grand for the porch just to get some, yep. some piers under there and make sure it's... I think that front porch looks nice. Though. It is a nice. Front. It is a nice looking. Place. And it really should be just a place where people can get yeah. some sun during the winter and yeah. be able to just kind of get out of the house. And, and it and it and it continues place. to give it the home environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you walk up to yes. to a home and not some kind of institutionalized. Or and if you look at setting. the neighborhood itself, if you come out of the home, take a right. I mean, all the homes basically do have porches. Yeah. If not side porches. Yeah. I have coffee outside every morning. Yeah. yeah right out of the patio with the, the newspaper. <laughs> the <laughs> Even in the winter. The major front porch is definitely, we're just talking about the little part that's to the side. Yeah. As the far left as oh. you look at it. Yeah. That's the part that doesn't have any real structural footings underneath that we can ascertain. So. Is silver okay? Oh. Um, a little funky. No, I think they need to be. Really yeah, it, there was definitely uh, more rot, you know, when they pulled the sink away, and that whole kitchen flooring is. It was more than cosmetic. Pretty spongy underneath, yeah. so they did what they could without. The next, you know, the next thing that ideally could be done at some point is is dealing with the whole kitchen floor, but you know, the all the water runoff from the back of the state hospital. You know, it just comes right down that hill. Right. Oh. And all the years and years that there were issues with water in the basement, um, and it's not nearly as bad as it used to be, yeah. but it did its damage in the day. So, mm -hmm. But we're thinking it's good It's good to go for a while. And, and, uh, well, how do you correct something like that? You just tear it all out. And I'm, I'm not even sure. You know, we would certainly have to put our heads together to see if that was something that was worth it. But, you know, with old houses, you know, once you start mm -hmm. poking around, it's... Yeah, I kind of wish you didn't. There was a lot of water in the basement our first visit there. It was very wet. When we went with Ray and I... Well, they did, yeah, I they've done the some water. drainage stuff around the periphery. Yep. And they did, you know, some up top in Cole Morgan and all that site redevelopment. And there was the... We did the redrive, redid the driveway, and there has been a sump pump in the basement now and then, but 
There really hasn't been any need for it lately. No, because when we went back, you and I and Ray and Michael, there was no water down there. No, it's it's sporadic depending on what's going on. I, I probably wouldn't be surprised if there was some right now, the just because the yeah. amount of water that's yeah. fallen. But I bet you since they built Paul Morgan in that, maybe they the well, Cole well, Morgan actually had to put in a lot of reti water yeah. retention system yeah. so oh. that it, it prevents the store flow that would be coming down there. And plus, if you regrade it around the house, it sounds like it did. Then that that was done. Yeah. I think Cole Morgan did it because we got flooded nasty as soon as yeah. we started. Yeah. yeah, there was yeah there was definitely some remediation that happened. And yeah, no, I remember it was a big deal. So it's probably better than if something hadn't happened. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing because more often than not, proximity construction usually exacerbates water right. problems. Right. right. So that's good. And it did. <laughs> yeah. And it was resolved. So, yeah. yeah, that was one of the things the planning board, because you can't just build something and create things off site. So, even though they did, but it was remediated. So. Yeah. So, I think we're in the home stretch. So, let me uh, monitor the, uh, the painting, and it really should be probably the next two to three weeks. So as Will soon as it's done and ready so to go, we can get together we can and look at our site visit. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Yeah. This should stop raining by so August, I day. believe. <laughs> uh, You're lovely. I've been building dams around my construction sites to eat the water out of the cellar holes while we pour concrete. They just can't do it. So I scrambled today and started pouring. I thought it was going to rain more, though. Yeah, uh -huh. there, there's still Don't more schedule. That. Yeah, just a, just a gap. <laughs> well, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> oh. So, Danielle, would you like to talk to to us about anything at Grove Street? Well, the peg is pretty well covered. Everything as far as changes that have happened, changes that are coming, um, work that needs to be done. Nothing out of the ordinary. No violent actions or anything up there or anything like that. Uh, Not a Grove. All right. <laughs> I know, over here. I know, I get it. <laughs> but it's been pretty quiet, hasn't it? Yeah. Good. Excellent. And so, would you like to see? Well, you know, they've covered what's happening there. I don't know if there's anything else you want to ask us about. No, well, I'm asking you <laughs> what you feel about Grove Street Inn. Oh, and this is, we're thrilled about the changes. It's been time because I know you were a hundred percent with us when we all put our heads together and oh. said we need to do something at that place absolutely and I think we've come a long way I mean how many years now have we figured Ray and I have been doing nine and a half away. Yep. Yes. six or seven years yes. yeah. has sequestration provided service to all? no not directly you know, what it may actually have more of an impact is um, a larger census as people actually are starting to lose services in other mm -hmm. areas that... We can see that. Um, you know, it's interesting because, as Claire had talked about, they're, they're cutting their programming available services to a number of people who, mm -hmm. who, who are going to be an increased risk, and, and mm -hmm. I think this is nationwide. So it's, it's the ripple effect, I don't know if the, don't know if the ripples hit you quite yet. Mm -hmm. But we're actually anticipating some increases in some of our funding because of Chapter 257, which is a Massachusetts thing yep. right. um, that has to do with rate relief for having been flat funded in um, our state contracts for many years. And this coming fiscal year that starts in a couple of weeks, um, in that year, we're going to see increases in our um, DD, Developmental Disability Programs um, budgets in the following year in our mental health residential and outreach programs. So we're thrilled about that. That's incredible. I that's wish the that state would look at municipalities that way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we're 35 percent. We've been cut 35 percent. Yeah. And with no, no relief. So yeah. Just, also, just increased mandates. Mm -hmm. and and incidents. With the crazy weather. I mean, that's, yeah. I know. Yeah. 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 It's just. It's awful. Mm -hmm. and incidents around the country that have happened have. I think opened people's eyes on the mental health issues. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably where we're seeing this. I hope mm -hmm. that it's opened some eyes. Yeah. Um, Again, we're lucky in that score in Massachusetts as well because everybody here already has health insurance, and that's, I guess, being rolled out um, hopefully across the country now. But um, when that happened, 
we uh, were able to serve just about anybody who came in our doors. And before that, there was a gap. There was a gap. There were a few years that were kind of a gap because we first we had a lot of federal funding and um, contracts with the state to be able to cover people who didn't have health insurance if they had a serious mental illness. Mm -hmm. Then some of those were eroded and cut completely, and we weren't able to serve everybody that came in the door. We did apply to the United Way. We had a scholarship fund, but it wasn't that much. It was like 10000 a year or something, maybe less. I don't know. Do they apply? You mean they just come to service them and apply for, like, mass health? We send them to actually Cooley Dick or other places that help them um, fill out the application. Mm -hmm. I have some residents who they had insurance before, then they lost their jobs, then that went on to Mass Health. They said, "Thank God for that." Yeah. Well, it's incredible, really, because we yes. we used to have people come in who needed help, especially people that were in the homeless shelters, who didn't even have an address, and they weren't they didn't qualify for any kind of insurance relief and they um, would come in and we would have to stretch the scholarship fund but it didn't really we had to put people on waiting lists so now um, we're, we're lucky about that so. it's an that mass health is an outstanding coverage I mean it really is yeah it's yes. everything yes. yeah huh? I yeah. didn't even know they had it up cool and dick mm. yeah they have an office I mean I haven't personally talked to the people but we've been sending people there and they they come back with insurance, <laughs> so I guess it's oh, that's working. wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, you just walk through the doors. You never know how much it's going to cost you or your family. They have a pretty gonna... aggressive approach to it, too, at Cooley Dick. Do they? On uh, mass health, things such as that, yeah. They're right on top of it. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, aggressive? Well, they go right, you know, they'll they'll assist you in any way they can to get you covered. Oh, really? Um, I never even know and, that. And um, they've been doing it for, for a couple of years now. It's really, they have a whole department for it now. Hmm. I just want to add something about um, ServiceNet's commitment that you may or may not know. Not only having been a partner with us since, when did we start this, 1990 or something, when you were probably still Valley Programs yeah. and, mm -hmm. um, and HCAC, we made a commitment to Grove Street and it's functioned so smoothly for all those years, you know, I don't think ever hardly under capacity, so I can't even imagine the cumulative total that folks, of folks that have come through there and gotten assistance mm -hmm. for moving their lives forward, but um, I think I've told you before this care system that we used to bring the federal dollars in, mm -hmm. it used to be a Franklin, Hampshire, Hamden County thing, um, it's been reconfigured, Hamden County went with the city of Springfield and now it's a Berkshire Franklin, Hampshire County configuration, and I'm no longer being the administrator, but it's Hilltown CDC. So there's a whole setup, there's a whole other structure in Berkshire County. And it was actually, the, some of the sheltering programs were Berkshire Community Action, who is struggling in, in a way similar to probably the ways that Claire just described, mm -hmm. but they're really no longer able to support their homeless shelter system and ServiceNet is coming in to take one for the team in Berkshire County wow. and the shelter and housing division head um, came out of a program in Pittsfield so Jace That's Ketty great. so he Thank certainly you. he knows the area and the programs and Jay being connected now in all three counties and plugged into the regional network mm -hmm. you know it just and it puts everybody on the same page, and we just and there's losing. certainly not enough money to fund anything adequately. No. So, so for them to step in and say yes, we will, we will do this because it's the right thing, and then and figure out programmatic mm -hmm. configurations and, and maybe some dollars that they can apply. Is hoping they lost the United Way grant because I think the United Way lost faith that they were going to be able to deliver the services. So. Jay and I went and met with them, and uh, it was there was no way to restore it right away. But next year we might be able to get that funding back. And we're looking into a number of ways, and we're making some minor, not major at all, really, um, cutbacks or reconfigurations of some of the services. They had this um, giant emergency shelter with, in my opinion, too many people in one place, uh, more beds than we have here, and. Um, we're transition. We're changing some of those to transitional housing beds, which is really what was supposed to happen under those grants. So we're kind of going back to what it was supposed to be, and it's going to be a little bit more economical. And we're looking for. We have a month-to-month -month lease, 
so we can get out of that and save some money as mm -hmm. soon as we find a smaller location which we're looking into. So it's a lot of work ahead, but I think it'll, it'll be fine. Why so did they still see very few funding sources? Um, I don't know. It was a puzzle to know why they were delivering services that were different from what it said in their grants. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they were thinking or why. Mm -hmm. Maybe they thought it was cheaper to provide the services under one roof, but in the end, it was um, kind of nightmarish to walk in there and see that. That's, maybe. that's the old urban renewal model. It's just yeah. concentrate mm -hmm. everything in one place yeah. and provide all the services, and then consequently, when it collapses, it collapses big time. Yeah. And actually, speaking to the point about the federal government becoming more cognizant of issues around mental illness and things like that, it doesn't manifest in form funding. They continue to cut funding, and there is not, there's been a lot of noise about it, but there's been no subsequent trickle down, if you will. There hasn't been any, in fact, there's this, that's where the sequestration is actually going to hurt as well. Is that. So the problems that we see, Developing and the pressures are just increasing, and um, you know, the, being aware of it isn't doing something about it, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. but they did send a hundred grand more to CDBG. And, well, that was and yeah, they, that's my yeah, wow. getting furloughed. It yeah. seems to be impacting him. Yeah, you know, he has to take seven days off without pay, but he says we're good. You know, we were thinking this five percent sequestration. Reduction on top right. of whatever they were already yep. going to hit yep. us. He but said you get, it's, it's not going to come to our level. But the, the but this is this is a one-off, isn't it? It's just tailings from projects that uh, weren't. Yes. Yeah. So it's not like this is they they decided that they're going to give us an increase. This is actually just the uh, the discovered money as it were. Exactly. So yeah. can is okay, right? I mean. Yeah. But they gave it to us, so it's good. Yeah, that's I what know. counts. <laughs> that's what counts. <laughs> the last two years were pretty depressing. <laughs> that's terrible. Have you heard anything about ESG? No, but I, we, I guess, well, we're hoping we, we don't really have any reason to think that, it's, that we're not going to get it. Um, ESG? It's an emergency, it used to be shelter grant. And yeah. It was like the only other pot for shelter operations than in addition to CDBG. I think it was now it's emergency solutions grant, mm -hmm. and they really are trying to focus on prevention. But the people that are running the programs for all the folks that already find themselves homeless, and even though there's this sh paradigm shift in the program design from housing first, you still have to have a transition period. You can't just say, "Okay, we're just right. going to take everybody and house them." So there's still a very, very much needed critical role for the emergency shelter system. Mm -hmm. But ESG, um, the only other pod, when we when we shifted the county configuration, like the majority of the families in motels and the really, really high numbers were Holyoke, Chicopee, Springfield. There were a few in Greenfield. And the reason why when, when we did the continuum back in 1994, we weren't able to draw in the big money because we don't have the level of need similar to like a big metropolitan. <coughs> so Excuse when Springfield said we're just using McKinney within the boundaries of Springfield and that left Hamden County with nowhere to go, we said come to our table because the need scores for Holyoke got us on the radar screen for HUD and we were able to pull in about a million and a half every year. But, <coughs> Excuse me. but when we lost being able to claim that hotel motel population and the, the higher numbers of people that are being seen then like community actions ESG money went from over I think probably about a quarter of a million to seventy thousand dollars a year so like Tony Hockstad who's been doing all our work and Enrique Pacheco who was working they're gone at the end of this month so the continuum reconfiguration has ramifications for the amounts of dollars that we can bring in which just nobody's job is guaranteed. No. So that gives them. I mean, they've always been Franklin, Hampshire, and now Berkshire. You guys aren't down in Hamden too much, but yeah. um, but it it's there's just a lot of moving parts and and very very few places to go for money to run a homeless shelter. Everyone's all about you know the housing programs, and maybe someday we'll turn a grocery in into something else, but. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, you have to have it.
a sports yeah. bar. Did you see us go without it? <laughs> Ann, how, how did you make out with the fundraising? We had our most successful fundraiser to date. The story uh, was a um, Stories of Hope. It was a breakfast event at 8, and then we had that. At the Delaney House? At the Delaney right. House, and of course we had that ice storm the day it was supposed yeah, to be. That's right. So we had to switch it to the next morning, and people were wonderful. Everybody, but except for you know maybe 25 people or so, couldn't make the next day. And we had a wonderful turnout. The programming was so inspirational. Um, we had a wonderful sheltering story from Franklin County that people just really responded to. Um, and just, How many people showed up? Uh, let's see, there were 150. That's wow. a good one. Uh, and uh, people were extremely generous. Uh, it was, uh, we made three times more than we've ever made in the past. Um, so it was, it was wonderful. We, it was an hour long, but it was packed. Um, and uh, it was really, we featured all of the services, obviously, the, sh the, um, the sheltering, the mental health services, our clinical services. And uh, one of the um, key moments of the morning is one of our um, women that we, um, is in one of our DBIS programs, our Developmental and Brain Injury Services program, she did a solo. Um, and it was, who will love me as I am? And it wasn't a dry eye. People <laughs> stood up and gave her a standing ovation. So, Excellent. Do you think you'll be doing it here in the Northampton instead of going out that way? Well, it's 20 feet out. I know, but. Yeah, it's halfway. You know, can I finish, please? <laughs> we were talking about that, okay? Mm -hmm. About bringing it to Holyoke and why not have it here in Northampton like you always have. Yeah, and I think we, we always do the rounds, um, you know. So you we, rotate? No, we always put it out to, right. you know, because obviously. We put it out to bid for different venues. Right. We, we did because we went yeah. to the garden house, right? Yeah, well, you know, it's kind of hard to argue with three times as much as they made. Mm -hmm. three I know, they did very well. We got through the garden. We were, the garden yeah. house has a maximum number. I can't remember what it is. It's Because I know, Councilor Tracy, we, we, we wanted to have the, the garden. Capacity, yeah. so that was super. Slight that is more. Evening. We also yeah. wanted to have to have it be convenient for the people coming off of 91, right. both north and south, right. because we are up in Franklin County, and we're also in a little, we have programs in Holyoke, yeah. Chicopee area as well, and even yeah. a couple in West Springfield. Well, now you've transitioned to Berkshire well, as well. We're, yeah. yes. to we're going to have another one out there. We don't expect those people to come over the mountain. Right. To Pittsfield, but the one that had yeah. the, uh, the um, garden house was excellent. And we're yeah, evaluating. But it's small space. Uh, we're working on our fundraising plan for next year. And we're looking at whether it makes sense to reinstate. We had originally decided to skip a year of the evening of hope right, right. because we wanted to focus all our attention on one event that would cover all our programs instead of having multiple ones because we don't want to, we didn't want to ask people to come out twice, but we yeah. didn't want to limit our fundraising that. to just the shelter and housing programs. But it turned out there wasn't that much overlap. The, most of the people who came to this fundraising event we're not the same crowd that had been coming to the other one. So oh. Ann and I are, uh, as we speak, um, working on the fundraising plan for next year. We're at least considering whether or not to bring that back and then have a, a separate one for everything else. Because that was nice having it in the evening like Yeah, that. and then we could go back to that venue for that, and we could take advantage again of, uh, of Jake, the, the chef. Because the mayor's office to. couldn't attend it because it was early in the morning, remember? Yeah, they I know. Do it. You know. So we're looking at all of those factors and board members. I'm glad um, to hear that. Have different board members have different other ideas. So we'll, we're working on that before we're going to hopefully finish it before the next beginning of the next fiscal year and figure out we're we're still doing some mailings and we're going to figure out what okay. we may we just had a golf tournament in Greenfield for the sheltering programs up there uh, and we're evaluating we, we made very little well I mean it's it's not nothing. But, but for all the effort, <laughs> if you can, you can <laughs> So by having My husband had a great time at the golf oh, tournament. Right. It was a beautiful day. I mean, it stopped raining Saturday. We had our golf tournament, and it was, we bought it $6,000 for the Franklin County Shelter. That's so, good. Yeah, yeah it's I good. thought it's that good. was pretty good. That is. Uh, and everyone had a good time. It's kind of the, Fran LeMay runs the Greenfield Family Inn, and we kind of nicknamed that tournament the, the LeMay Family Reunion. <laughs> 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 Twist everyone's arm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of the women's <laughs> fund that we went to that big one that they had at the um, the log cabin about a couple of weeks ago, two or three weeks ago. Plus, was packed. Yeah. Well, you sure picked the right day. That's the only non-rainy day. Oh, yeah, it was wonderful. And, uh, you know, 
uh, the golf, the people who ran that little golf course, were just, they were saying they're just suffering because there's no one's playing golf. Mm -hmm. you know? Six green is nothing to see. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think there was that. Was That's good, though. I mean, you were able to cancel that and then do it the next day. It was fa fantastic. Yeah. And, of course, the, the uh, model that we've been using, the Benavon model, sort of... Um, preaches that if you kind of do a, a shorter event and mm -hmm. have less moving parts and you are very respectful of people's time and you pack a lot in and then people can go off to work, whether it's at breakfast time or lunch time or maybe, mm -hmm. you know, we could do something yeah. in the evening, that that really is the way to um, and make sure that the program illustrates right. what you do very well, which that did. The video was really something. And, uh, and it, we, it seemed to work. We were very pleased. And very happy to hear that. Yeah. Well, 150 people. That is. Yeah. That is. That's we, also, good. we also had a fair number of pretty high profile people that I think um, was an incentive for people to come back next year. They saw, oh, this is the place to be. You know, we had, we had, um, well, Claire Higgins was there. <laughs> we had <laughs> Chief Oliver, the, the um, <laughs> district attorney. And who else did we have? We, we had, had um, the, um, the press. The marketing, the press person out of Stanley Rosenberg's office, yes. Tom, Tom Mitchell. Tom. Tom. Yeah. Yes, Tom. And uh, we were very fortunate that even though the next morning was kind of icy, if you remember, yep. that we still had some folks come down from Franklin County, um, the sheriff's very, office, very and yeah. So, yep. and it was a, it was a very. The thing that was nice about it is that people got to see the staff. You know what our staff does in yeah. really serving and supporting people, and that, you know the homeless services are obviously sheltering people, but as you know helping them and supporting them to, you know, with counseling or whatever they need to, um, you know, try to start their lives. The next step. Step. Are you still doing sharing our stories? <clears throat> no, we just, stop? well, that's what we're evaluating, but probably what we learned from that is that in the first few months of doing it, we kind of used up all the people that we, that we knew that we wanted to bring in, and we were pressuring staff all the time to invite more and more people and at some point, you sort of run out of people who want to come after work and hear yeah. about service now because not everybody's that interested in it. Mm -hmm. Having a big fundraising event once a year with a breakfast and some high-profile people and a video and stuff, it's easier to get people to rally and bring their friends once a year mm -hmm. than to kind of be after them. And what, what we found was after the first few months of doing sharing our stories, the numbers were dwindling. We do the we do the event, which which took a lot of work on Anne's part, and also we had to bring in the staff to tell the stories, yeah. and the the individual the families in some cases would come in, and they would see only three or four you know a handful of right. people. So at the last minute, if we only had a few people signed up, we'd bring in some staff to fill up the room. <laughs> we said maybe this is not meant to happen every week, every month, um, after all. And there was also a fair amount of overlap between the program that we did at the Ask event, the, which is what we call it, the once a year thing, and the sharing our stories. So we thought we'd focus our, our attention during the year on getting really good stories for that once a year thing, mm -hmm. and not trying to stretch ourselves to do it every every month. Yeah, but that's like still under consideration. Maybe we'll do it a couple of times, I don't know. Yeah. We had a wonderful family member come in, and we've been taking care of her brother for quite a number of years. and. Just shows you the impact that you know supporting that family member has on the whole family. It was really very moving. It's not just putting somebody in a bed for the night. Yeah. No. It pushed them out in the morning. I know. Mm -hmm. Well, how long have you been at the shelter? Me. Um, in lots of different capacities, a little over ten years. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. We have a lot of longevity. At service now, which I think speaks to the dedication that the, our staff has. Mm -hmm. And that's important. Good you brought your wonderful assistant with you. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you. He pulls the short straw. <laughs> <laughs> well, I Get to show up in really exciting meetings and sit on really comfortable chairs. Yeah. <laughs> and I know we don't have any public here, so. I don't have to worry about public comment, but I want to thank all of you for being here again mm -hmm. from ServiceNet and Danielle with the Grove Street Inn mm -hmm. and Peg, as usual. Thank mm -hmm. you very, very much. And tell David that we hope that he gets better soon. I will. So what are you doing tonight?
<laughs> hey, you see? My, my kids said, can we have people over? I said, as long as nobody takes my chair. <laughs> and the heat lost last night, too. That's right. Well, I don't want to say that. One and done. <laughs> I'm all about the Bruins these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. You probably already eat. You can stand up. I was standing up. Okay. Thank you, Anna. Um, Who doesn't like much. second dinner? Bye. 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 Thank you. Nice to see you all again. Goodbye. Take care. Just no. quickly, I want to talk awesome. about the um, agenda for the month of July. Meant to bring them over. Um, Johnson High School will be here, and I think Bill, you might know <laughs> who he's sending. John McKinney. He's from over Walter Southwest. He's been in his staff I highly recommend him. Okay. So, and then we have. Um, Good night, all. Thank Good night. you. Night. See you, Ruth. Bye-bye. Her name is Lisa. She's the director of Leased Housing and Dash Programs. She's coming also. Who is that, Lisa? Lisa. Mm -hmm. Lisa oh. Felty. Don't know her. And John McKinney, who is the NHA social worker. I know John McKinney. Yep. The job title is Mixed Population yep. Service Coordinator. And uh, so he'll be here too in July. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Abel. And then we will not have a meeting in August. We have a vacation. All right, uh, move the adjourn. Second. Aye. 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 <laughs>